Today is Palm Sunday. And this obviously is the beginning of the Easter story. I want you to lean to the person next to you, and those of you who are joining us online, I want you to ask the people that are there, lean to the person next to you and answer this question. Why did Jesus go to Jerusalem? Go. Ask each other real fast. If you were to answer, why would Jesus go to, why did Jesus go to Jerusalem? If your answer is to die on the cross for our sins, you're wrong. And let me explain why. So uh, we're doing a two-week series of talks called Passion Parables. And last week, Pete did a fantastic job. And I, Jesus rides on a donkey He's going from uh, Mary and Martha's house, right, and uh, Bethany. He's gone up from Jericho up through the hills. He gets on this donkey and he goes into Jerusalem. And let's talk about why exactly he did that because this is one of the most profound things that you can, under, that you can get and apprehend and understand based on the Easter story. So. Let's pull this up real fast. So, all right. So last week, uh, Pete talked about um, when Jesus came to Jerusalem, he did two things. The very first thing that he did is that he went to the temple. Let me draw the temple here as a first grader would, right? And let's call that the temple. He goes to the temple, and then there are people that have exchange, money exchange. If you've ever gone to another country, you have American currency, you need to exchange it. Whenever you're going to go to the temple, the temple takes a specific currency. And so what they did is there were people that would exchange your money into temple currency so that you could buy animals to sacrifice, essentially, because if you lived in Greece, got on a boat, and, and a month later, you're in Israel, you don't want to be taking a lamb with you, right? You want to buy it when you're there, but you're from Greece, so you have Greek money. So he goes to these um, people who were sitting at these tables, and what does he do? He completely goes nuts on them, right? And he cleanses the temple, that's the way theologians call it, by getting rid of the money changers. My house was made to be a house of prayer, and for those of you who were last week and you remember, but you have turned it into what? A den of thieves, right? So then that's the first thing he does. The second thing that he does is that he is over here, and he goes down the Mount of Olives, and he sees the temple up here, right? So he's at, he is at uh, Mary Martha's house. He goes over here, he's walking, and he sees a fig tree. And when he sees the fig tree, what does he do to it? He sees that there's no fruit on it, and he looks at it and says, may you never bear fruit again, and it completely withers in front of their eyes. So he cleanses the temple, 
he takes the, the, the fig tree and curses the fig tree. These are what is called symbolic prophetic acts. These are not happenstance. In the Old Testament, Isaiah, the prophet, walked around naked for three years. Why? Because it's probably a little weird, but he walked around naked for three years to symbolize the Egyptians being judged by God and taken captives by the Assyrians. Um, Jeremiah put a... Um, uh, uh, what is the, the, take my yoke upon you. He wore a yoke like this for months to talk about Israel is going to be taken away in captivity. Jeremiah bought a plot of land that when we come back from captivity, we're going to have places where we're going to grow things. Hosea, God told him to marry a prostitute and to have children with a prostitute. So there are all these different physical things that they did and these are all called parables. And so we're doing this series called Passion Parables. Passion referring to the Easter week. And parables, these are physical parables. And what we're looking at today are verbal parables. A parable comes from the Greek word um, parabolo, which means to throw beside. Um, uh, if we have anybody in here that's like 22 or younger, whenever your um, parents or your um, guardians want to teach you a lesson, right? What do they do? They tell you, don't do it. And then what do they do? They usually tell you a story. Now, do, did, your, did your parents do that? Did they ever like, uh, let me tell you, when I was your age, we had this and this, and I had to earn my own money. It started when I was five. I had five, I had four construction jobs, right? And so that's what a parable is. A parable is meant to be a lesson. And so a parable essentially is, I have this thing right here, and to help you understand what I think of it, I am going to throw this thing over here. Okay? So I'm going to throw this beside it. All right? So let's just talk about then the... Um, okay, let's talk about the two stories. So before we get to the two stories, and this is huge, hang, me, hang with me through these two stories, right? So there's this verse in the Old Testament in Hosea that says this, when I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your ancestors, it was, it was like seeing the early fruit of a fig tree. And what I want to do is I want to talk about two other images, right? So Jesus tells two other parables. And the first is a parable of two sons. Are there any guys here that you grew up with a brother? All right, okay. All right, one, sure. Some of you don't want to raise your hands because you think it's stupid. All right, so and they want to tell the third parable about people going to hell. So what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. Now, who's Jesus talking to? Jesus is talking to the Jewish religious leaders. And he says, let me tell you a story. There's a guy that had two sons. And he went to the first son and he said, son, I want you to go and work today in the vineyard. And the son said, I will not. But later he changed his mind and he went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? <laughs> the first they answered. Right? And then Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are enter entering the kingdom of God before you. Now why is that huge? I want you to think of someone right now that you think you're better than them, morally. Someone that you know. All right? 
So lean into the person next to you and share, who is that person that I know that honestly, I'm better than them morally, right? You're not gonna do that, right? Because that would be incredibly, incredibly arrogant. But for Jewish people, there was a long line. There's a long line of people. If this is heaven, there's a long line of people getting into heaven. And it goes on and on and on and on. on. Here's the last person. So Jewish leaders believed that if you're a Jew, you're gonna go to heaven because God has basically made a way for you to go to heaven. But who's going to be the first in line? The priests, right? The, the, the teachers, all of these religious people, right? They're going to be here in the front of the line. Who's going to be in the last of the line? Cowboys fans right here. Though, are we getting Zeke Elliott? Are we getting Zeke Elliott? From, we're not? We're not. Okay, all right. So it would be the tax collectors, people who were Jews who basically would work for the Roman army to collect taxes for them, and prostitutes. These people look down on these people. Jesus comes along and says, I have news for you. You think you're first. I actually think you're last. Because the last will be first, and the first will be last. Because you guys are arrogant turds. And what, that's what he said, right? Not really. But that's basically what he was saying. It's like, you arrogant religious leaders, you think you're better than everyone else. Let me tell you the story of the two sons. One said, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. But they ended, ended up actually going. What, what tax collector do you know that said, I'm actually not going to follow God, but actually ended up following God? Help me out. Jesus' disciple. Matthew. Last. Now he's first. Who's a prostitute that said, I'm not gonna follow God, I'm gonna go my own way, turned around and started following Jesus. Mary Magdalene, right? The tax collectors and the prostitutes are gonna go ahead of you. So this parable is a judgment against religious leaders in the same way the fig tree in the temple. But there's one last story that we need to get to. Um, and to understand that, you have to understand another Old Testament passage. This is on page seven. Um, Isaiah chapter five, verse one says this. All right. Isaiah five, verse one. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. This is Isaiah, who was uh, a poet, and a, and a singer. Like, usually when you're listening to Christian radio, it's usually terrible, right? And, and it, it, it's because in the Christian community for some reason, it's now changing. Uh, it used to be the best poets and the best writers and the best artists were people that were in sync with God and they were able to look around them and to create art. Unfortunately, that changed in America, and there's, there's beginning to be a change for that, but Isaiah says, I'm gonna sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. Who, what's the vineyard? My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up, cleared it of stones, he planted it with the choicest vines, he built a watchtower in it, and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. So does everybody see the story? The nation of Israel is like a guy who went and built a vineyard, a watchtower, picked out the stones, planted, but it didn't grow fruit. 
So every Jew knew this passage. So Jesus bumbles into Jerusalem with thousands of people following him on a donkey. He lands, goes straight to the temple, curses the fig tree, gets rid of the people that are the money changers, tells the story of the two sons, which ticks them off royally, and then he tells them another story that goes like this. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants, and they beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. And then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he said, I'm going to send my son. They're going to respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. And so they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. So everybody following along with that story? So Jesus goes straight up to the religious leaders. And he says, I have a story to tell you. There is a guy who had a plot of land. And he built a wall around it. Built his house right here. Built a tower. Why a tower? So you could go up it and you could look out at your enemies when they're coming. Because there would always be marauders and thieves and that sort of thing coming by. So you could always see, is this an army coming in the distance or is this my Uncle Bill? And so there's a tower and then he said he got rid of the stones and planted a vineyard. And then he said, you know what? I gotta be honest, I wanna live in Washington. So he moved to Washington State. This guy that owned all of this went to another place. And he found some people, and this was normal in Jesus' time. You don't have any money, but you're a farmer. I owned land, but I'm leaving town. Let's have an arrangement. You farm my land, which I won't make you pay for, and we'll split the produce, 50-50. And people were like, cool, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll do that. So this guy leaves and turns around and there are a bunch of tenants that are farming the land. When harvest time came, he sent his servant to go and collect the money. And what did they do to him? They whacked him. And he said, I'm gonna send some more. So he kept sending more and more and more people and eventually said, I'm gonna send my son to collect this produce and take it back to me and sell it. And what did they do to the son? We read the story, right? The son was killed. And so Jesus talking, and hang with me here, Jesus talking to the religious leaders looks at them and says, therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? What's the owner gonna do when he comes to these tenants after he's killed 15 of his best workers? And what did the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the chief priests say? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. And Jesus said, I'm talking about you, idiots. Haven't you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, me. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in his eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you right here in Jerusalem, right here in front of the temple. God is going to destroy this place and give it to another people, the pagans, the Gentiles, and they will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone, when they're taking it out of the vineyard and falls on this stone, they're going to basically get crushed and broken to pieces, and anyone on whom it falls will be crushed, and look what it says. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they had just seen Jesus' parables, when they heard his parables, they knew he was talking about them, 
and they looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Fig tree, money changers, two sons, and now the story of the vineyard owner. I said at the beginning that Jesus did not come to Jerusalem to save you from your sins, and that is correct, except it's not correct. Jesus came to Jerusalem, and the first thing that I want you to write down is this. I have two things I wanna share. First thing is, Easter week, Palm Sunday to Easter, was God's final judgment upon dead religion. This is God's final judgment upon dead religion. Before Jesus could die on the cross to save us from our sins, which he did, judgment had to be pronounced by prophet Jesus to the religious leaders who had basically turned this thing into a mess. And so, in this area, it's so sad because even Christians now grow up in the same old dead religion, right? So religion is a human being trying to reach up to God and be good enough for God to say, you're cool, come on in, right? And then, but a relationship is God reaching down to us. Christianity is God reaching down to us. A dead religion is human beings trying to reach up to God and being good enough, right? And that it's just so sad because I see people in this area who each of these churches, not all of them obviously, but each, a lot of them, like you'll go to religious school and you'll go through confirmation and then you'll spend the rest of your life going through the motions, praying these prayers that you memorized and, and doing different things, whether you're Lutheran or Episcopalian or Catholic or whatever it is. And there are people who believe in Jesus, but they never know, ever. They never know if I'm gonna get in or not. People, people who call themselves Christians and they'll walk around and they really believe that God is up in heaven and he has a huge Excel spreadsheet. Some of you are really good with Excel, so you like this illustration, right? So God has a huge Excel spreadsheet and he has one column where he records all your good stuff that you did and then he has another column, all your bad stuff, and when you go to heaven, he's gonna hit reconcile, and if your bad stuff outweighs the good, where are you gonna go? Northern New Jersey, right? You're going to hell. You're going to hell, right? And if the good stuff outweighs the bad, you're gonna to go to heaven. And the, but what happens is, there's just a tremendous amount of shame with that. There's this utter shame, because here's the thing, nobody's good enough. That's the whole point of Jesus coming and dying on the cross, is none of us are good enough. And so why would we try to re revert back to that system? All right, we don't go to church, because if we don't, we're gonna go to hell. We go to church because as a community, we're to be ingrained with each other, encouraging with one another, learning from God's word, and then going out and being different people, even though we all struggle, right? Um, like Jesus comes along and he says, listen, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I have friends that are pastors in these churches and I love them all and they all have the gospel but somehow it's just been turned into this thing. And it's the same thing that Jesus comes along and he's like, listen, no, 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 I don't do, no, no, this is over. This is done once and for all. It's the final nail in the coffin. We're done with dead religion. We're gonna do it a different way. And so he says to like the Pharisees and teachers, right after he tells them this, he goes on and tells, tells them, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter nor will you let those who are trying to enter. People are coming to you for help, someone that is a prostitute, someone that more than likely has experienced a lifetime of abuse. You're ascribing their lack of faithfulness to God as they're not keeping the commandments, something like that. Jesus comes along like, you're just so full of it, shut up. 
just shut up. This person, this person's before you. This person's first. Come on in. Let's have a relationship. I forgive you. Sin no longer. That's what he said, prostitutes. Now, this was a... This was a, and I just need to make sure everybody gets this. This was a judgment upon 12 to 15 Jewish leaders in the first century that sent Jesus eventually to the Romans who were crucified. A lot of Christians through the last 2,000 years have used that incident 2,000 years ago to foster anti-Semitism, which is just absolutely ridiculous. Jesus was Jewish. All of his disciples were Jewish. There's nothing anti-Semitic about it. It was just acknowledging that's what happened. Well, what has happened over the last 2,000 years is that Christians, many, have turned this into an opportunity to prevent Jewish people from getting jobs and marijuana. So Lisa and I, uh, last year, were in Germany and we're, I'm following the trail of Martin Luther, the person that led the Protestant Reformation, and he did a lot of good. I had no idea that Martin Luther hated Jews so much. I didn't know that when um, Hitler came to power, he basically was taking quotes from Martin Luther, whose last book, Martin Luther is calling Jewish people pigs and all kinds of terrible things. Hitler comes along and he creates these pamphlets with the picture of Martin Luther and the swastika and says, we need to get rid of these people, just like Martin Luther said. I'm sure if Martin Luther was here today, if we had an opportunity to talk to him, he would say, that was probably one of the stupidest things I ever said, and I'm so sorry. That doesn't negate the good that Martin Luther did, but it was bad. So you wanna talk about, I'm going to Dachau. We're in Dachau, one of the the work concentration camps there. The guards live in these beautiful palatial houses. There's a pool. There are tennis courts. And on the other side, there is a huge gate and a watchtower where they're bringing dissidents and homosexuals and everybody that they wanted to get rid of to this camp, and they're just murdering them. Big crematorium right there. Throw them in there, put them there. You want to know who was responsible for that? Not Jews, Lutherans. Lutherans. Lutherans who didn't say anything. Hitler came along to the, to the Lutheran church and said, we're going to put your pastors on the state tax payroll and we're going to pay their salaries. You know, that's why people in Germany, they're atheists today, are like, we need to get rid of the church tax. I'm like, what's the church tax? Like, it's a tax that Hitler started. And so as I'm there and I'm walking around the grounds and I'm listening to the different tour guides, they're talking about the Christians who, like the Christians who owned BMW in Munich, the car company, who would go and take workers from Dachau and use them as slave labor to make their cars. And they're one of like 1,500 companies in Munich that would take labor from Dachau and force them as unpaid slaves to work and then they were killed. You know who did that? The Lutherans. Now, I'm not, if any of you have come from a Lutheran background, you should know that there was something called the confessing church at that time, who pastors who said, we're not gonna take the salary and we're not gonna stand for this and we are gonna stand up to Hitler. They signed what was called the Barman Declaration. One of these people was a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer who wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And he was hung in Flossenburg because he tried to create a situation where they could get Hitler killed. I just simply bring this up to say, there is no place, there is is a special place in hell reserved for Christians 
who use the Gospels as an opportunity for anti-Semitism. Last thing. The second thing I want you to know is the good news for us, the Gospel, is we can never be good enough. That's wonderful, that's wonderful news. Paul says, it's by grace you have been saved through faith, this is not from yourselves, it's a gift from God. So this coming Sunday is Easter, and hopefully you will all be here, and I want a special invite to those of you who are joining us online. I I know many of you, because I connect with you, you're in different countries or different states, and it is true, we want you to drive here next week, and I'm just kidding. But those of you who are local, we want you to come in person. And I have, I have a few asks that I would like to make of everyone here. First, I wanna encourage you to bring a friend. And if you can, I wanna encourage you to go to the 12 o'clock service. We've added a third service. It's gonna be just as good as the other two, and, but we wanna encourage you, we're trying to make room. And if you're able to go and bring friends to that service, that would be great. Because the whole purpose of Easter is what? To sleep in. So you can go to the 12 o'clock service, that would be great. I wanna encourage you to leave. I wanna encourage you to park as far away as you can, if you can, and leave the front parking space to our most treasured guests. Who are the most treasured guests that are gonna come on Easter? It's easy. First and foremost, it's the elderly. In our church, the elderly are our dear saints, and we love them, and we wanna give them the closest spot. Those who have like new babies or Um, people that have disabilities where it's still gonna gonna be easier. Can we please park as far as possible to leave those spots open? Um, And then finally, I wanna encourage you, starting today, to read Matthew chapter one through 28. If you start today, you'll end on Easter Sunday next week, and it will take you through the final week of Jesus. I want us thinking about his passion and what he did, all right? Let's pray. We're so thankful, God, for the grace that you give us. It's like the judgment of dry bones that are dead, but the dry bones that are rattling and coming to life from dead religion that's judged to new life in you, this new covenant, not a heart of, a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh, this relationship. This is what we want from you. This relationship that it doesn't matter if we have been prostitutes or tax collectors or anything else, nothing is barring us from being with you. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.